Good evening, church. We turn with me to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. We will be in verse, the latter part of verse 5, all the way through verse 12. Allow me to read. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. The tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue sets among our members as which defiles the entire body and sets a fire the course of our life and sets on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds or reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a reckless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes both blessing and cursing, my brethren, this thi these things ought not to not be this way. Does the fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a, olive, a vine produce figs, nor can salt water produce fresh? Pray with me. Father, our desire this evening is to understand the gravity of the power of the tongue, not based on our own understanding, but based on what your word says that is true and pure. Lord, help us or teach us that this little member would be something that we can control by your power, by your working of your Holy Spirit. Use your word as a tool to do this also, the means of grace that are found in the teaching and preaching of your word. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. July 18th, 64 A.D. The night of this hot night of the 18th, as Caesar Nero was ruling over Rome, a fire sparked. This fire that would spark would not be tamed for six days. And as Caesar Nero stood on his balcony, it was said that he played a fiddle as he watched Rome burn. After six days, and 70% of Rome burned down, 14 districts in total, it was said that it was the most destructive fire to ever hit Rome. But this wasn't the worst of it. If it wasn't bad enough that most of these districts that were burned were what we consider ghettos for the poor, rumors began to spread. One rumor was that Caesar Nero had set the blaze on fire and put thugs in charge of keeping the people from putting the fire out. The other rumor that was predominant was Caesar Nero put propaganda out to say that the Christians, this new cult, he called it, had set Rome on fire. And then Caesar Nero found excuse to torture hundreds, maybe even thousands of Christians. Caesar Nero was the most notorious ruler that would torture Christians. He would set them ablaze on his 
garden walks, he would set them on stilts and burn them alive, and they would serve as torches for his garden parties. And the same Susan Nero would put these Christians in the Colosseum and let them be torn to pieces by wild beasts. But all that started with a flame and then a lie. It didn't take much. It was enough for 70% of Rome to burn down and then Caesar Nero to get exactly what he wanted. He wanted to rebuild these ghettos according to what he wanted in these districts. A lie. July 13th, 2021. You guys remember this. The Dixon Fire. Northern California. That burned Butte County, Plumas County, Lisey County, Shasta, Tehama. This fire, if you remember this, could be seen from space. The space station started taking pictures of this fire. It was the single biggest fire with one source, the biggest fire that California had ever seen. From July 13th, it was not contained to October 25th of the same year. And when it was done, it burned down 963,000 acres. Let me have you wrap your head around what that looks like, because for some of you, you think, well, what's an acre? What size is that? Can you give me a picture? Well, I'll give you a picture of what a million, which is close to what burned, a million acres looks like or what it would take you to travel. Imagine yourself here in Redondo Beach. From the coast, you would travel just to get the width from west to east. To get the width, you would have to travel all the way to Disneyland. Now, to get the height, you guys all know where the Korean Friendship Bell is, right in San Pedro? Now imagine yourself starting at the Korean Friendship Bell and then traveling in a straight line as the crow flies to Fullerton. That is a million acres. That's what burned in the Dixie Fire. What did it start with? Well, PG and E eventually took they took a, a responsibility for it. It was a spark the size of my hand from a power line. Now, why do I tell you all this? According to James, the tongue is a worse culprit. It could burn more than that. Now, let me kind of just by... So you recall what we've already went through last week as a review. We've seen that the, the, the context of the tongue and the danger of unqualified teachers. You remember this? And it, tell, it tells us about these unqualified teachers as, as uh, not that there are many kinds of preachers, but that... We as the church don't get the mold from Scripture, which is 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, of what an elder and a preacher is. And the man that stands in the pulpit that is unqualified would be like a tongue of, of fire that burns everyone that listens. The standard is set by God and we must not compromise it. It doesn't mean, again, that the rest of the church is not set to, to hold to these same standards. It's obvious. But with little accountability, the tongue is dangerous. 
James tells us that these men must be perfect men, meaning mature men. We should require no less. And the one that is in this position should be able to bridle his tongue, because if he bridles his tongue, he controls his whole body. This man perfectly or maturely demonstrates faith. James also gives us the picture that shows us the potential of the tongue, the bridling of speech, the the first thing that the the horse's uh, mouth is put in, the bits are put in. Those are the smallest parts, the bridles, the bigger apparatus. And then the other illustration he gives us is the rudder and the ship. And then kind of just throws in there without you noticing the pilot himself. Both scenarios or examples imply an imperative to control the tongue. Bits, bridle, horse, rudder, ship. Listen, the ship is not controlled. The ship is not controlled by the rudder. In the same way that the the horse is not controlled by the bit, the horse is controlled by the rider. The ship is controlled by the pilot. Guess who you are? Again, the horse carries, in a different illustration, a different implication, if you understand, the horse carries one rider. If he fails to control the horse, he destroys only himself. But the pilot that controls the rudder, that fails to not control the ship, destroys hundreds, and in this day, thousands of people on the ship. Again, pointing us back to the position of a preacher. No matter how big or how small the flame is, the the potential is huge. You guys heard the phrase. um, Maybe you haven't actually, but for us older folks here, do you guys remember Smokey the Bear? What was Smokey the Bear saying? Only you can prevent forest fires. Only you... Only you can prevent the gossip, the slander, the harsh speech, the cursing. Only you can do that. So I only have two points this evening because I really want to push through because I have a ton of sub points within it. It's, if you remember from last week, is point one, the perverted potential of the tongue Found in verse 5 to verse 8, and the problem of pretending, verses 9 through 12. So I don't want to waste much time, so let's, let's look at verse 5. The perverted potential of the tongue. Have you heard this saying? Uh, good news travels fast. You heard that saying, right? It is true, right? Good news travels fast. Someone gets engaged or someone's wife is pregnant or, or you got a new job or, you know, many things. This good news travels fast. You know what travels faster? Bad news. Gossip. You know, it, it's funny because you could tell someone something and you and you, you, you know this is a sad part. Is you know particular people in the churches, if you tell them it's 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 almost like telling Fox News, right? Everyone's gonna know. As a matter of fact, you don't even eat you don't need an evite. Just tell a particular person and, and they'll spread it as far and wide. You know, your auntie on Facebook's gonna know. 
This, this is the potential of, of a perverted tongue. And, and I don't mean perverted as in perverse language, which it is also meaning that. I mean also that. But I mean perverted by, what I mean is distorted. Distorted usage of language. When James says this, he says, see, you see it there in verse 5, see how great a forest is set to flame by such a small fire. And if you read it right, the right way, I, I could be yelling this because he's telling you, see, see this. What he's saying is this, is again, you've seen this before where, where I tell you, listen up. He's telling the church, look, I'm about to tell you something of, of high importance and in other portions of Scripture, that word in the Greek is translated behold. Look at this. And then he could tell you this. It's almost like when Jesus tells the disciples, look at the fields, how ripe they are. Behold. In the same sense, James is saying this. Look. Look at the forest fire. Look at what this little flame has caused. It was set ablaze by a small conversation. What seemed innocent leaves a wake of destruction. No one in that conversation maybe paused and said, Is this true? Is it honorable? Is it right? No. Continue on. Proverbs calls gossip a juicy morsel. So in the, our passage here, this perverted potential of the tongue, we see the anatomy of an uncontrolled tongue. The anatomy of an uncontrolled tongue. We've already clearly established the analogy of of the tongue being a, a flame. But we have four more, more progressive than the next, heightened, one worse than the other. In this passage, we see this, these four progressive pictures showing us that this fire is it's, it's potential to cause so much damage. Let's look at what it says. First of all, in verse 6, what is described? It says the tongue is a fire. We understand that. The second one here, the, the anatomy of this flaming tongue, the very world of iniquity. What does this mean? What does he mean by this? You know, I love this because he, the usage of the word in the Greek cosmos, which translated world, This, when he uses this word, and based on the uses that he's already used it, let, let me show you where he's used it. Look at James 1. How is he using this word? When you understand this, in verse 27, James 1, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of a God, our Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and what? And to keep oneself unstained, by the world. This is what he means by the world in this passage. If we didn't understand that, go to chapter 4. We'll jump ahead a little bit. Chapter 4. Verse 4, you adulteress, do not know friendship with the world is what? Hostility, hostility towards God. He's not using it in a positive sense. And we understand he puts iniquity at the end of it, but you have to understand what does he mean by, by world? He means the world system. The system itself, the way the world already operates in their own speech. Look, most of the news you turn on, I don't care what you watch. You watch CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, whatever, whatever you watch, the majority of it is gossip unverified information. 
Yet, we put it out there as fact. We see all of this. People don't know what to take sides on with this whole Israel and, and Hamas and Hezbollah and Palestine. You know why we can't understand the truth? Because they all lie. And they all slander. They all take a bias. News, news is not news anymore. But what does that look like among us? I said it earlier. Did you pause and ask yourself, is it true? Is it honorable? Is it right? What it does is it falls into this system of sinfulness. The world is what he says. This type of speech that is opposed to God. The tongue, your speech, has the capacity towards damage unlike you could ever imagine. More than any other part of you. Let's look at Psalm 36. Keep your finger in the Psalms. We're going to jump around a little bit in Psalm, in Psalms. Let's go a little further back. Actually, let's start in, in, in chapter 10. I'm sorry. Because... It's better to progress forward than backwards. Let's see Psalm 10, verse 7. His mouth is full of cursings and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. Now turn to chapter 36. Verse 1. We'll start in verse 1, but leading down to verse 4, it says, Transgression speaks to the ungodly without, within his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for it flatters him with his own eyes. Concerning the, the discovery of his iniquity, there's that word and the hatred of it. Verse 3, the words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He plans wickedness upon his bed and sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not despise evil. Psalm 52. This is the anatomy of an uncontrolled tongue. Psalm 52, start in verse 2. Your, your tongue devises destruction like a, like a sharp razor, O worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, falsehood more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. If that wasn't enough, turn to Proverbs chapter 10. Starting in verse 6, blessed are, blessed are, blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Verse 11, the mouth of righteous is a fount of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Verse 14, wise men store up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish ruin, a ruin is at hand. Verse 31, the mouth of the righteous flows with wisdom, but the perverted tongue will be cut out. Verse 32, the lips of the righteous bring forth what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked, what is perverted. What, why do I take you on this? Because we could take, I could take you to another 30 verses, at least. Why? Because I'll tell you this. The only part of your body that is more talked about in Scripture as being divisive, destructive, is the mouth, the tongue, your speech.
The tongue contains a whole world of sin. The whole cosmos, James calls it, of iniquity. What is this second thing? Go back to James. The second description of this anatomy of the tongue. Verse 6, it says, The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. Defiles. In the Greek, stains. The tongue has the capacity to defile a whole life. Not bits and pieces, but the whole of the body, the whole of the self. It's, it's, you can't make compartments about your life. You can't say to yourself, I could go to work and, and be a certain way, talk a certain way, use language that is not honoring to the Lord, but then when I come over here among the brethren, I could, I could live this other life. No, see, this type of speech defiles your whole self. The whole body. And, and yes, do I mean that even physically? Yes. Sin has been known to actually affect you even in your physical body. Meaning it could cause distress so much that you lose sleep. Headaches. Why do you think you have anxiety and depression? This type of stuff that is not dealt with. This type of speech that is not dealt with, and you play both sides as if you can have a double life. And I'm going to talk about that later on. But let's look at what even Christ says. Look at Matthew chapter 12. He gives us, Jesus Christ himself gives us this broader picture of this defilement. You read this before. I know you have, but look at Look at what it says. He gives almost like a commentary to that one verse that we just read. In Matthew 12, verse 33, it says this. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. He's talking to the Pharisees. Look what he says to them. You brood of vipers. What does a viper have in its mouth? Poison. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. You know, you don't have, if we could take one, this is what Jesus did for you. If you could take one step back, James is focusing on the, on the tongue. He's saying, this is your problem. You, you spew out these things. Take one step back. And Jesus tells us, what you speak is coming from your heart. So your real problem is a heart issue, not just a tongue issue. Jesus puts his, his, his wise finger on the problem. Look, look at verse 36. But I tell you that every careless word, this is everyone in this room, understand me. Every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. There is no word that is being spoken that you will not answer for. Verse 37. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. What is he saying? Does he, is he saying that you can get to heaven by having good words? Is he saying that you go to hell because if you're having bad words? No. Remember the heart issue. If you sit here before me and you do not have a changed heart, 
a heart that has been redeemed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are the person that will be condemned by his words. Because by your life, you demonstrate that you do not belong to God. You can't make a tree good and make a tree bad. You can't. God can. God actually can graft you in to the vine. His church. His demonstration of redemption. He says this, this speech will be pervasive in your life, and it will demonstrate that you, you do not love God. Look at chapter 15. Stay in Matthew here. Chapter 15. Verse 11. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man. This, this is the argument that is going on. The Pharisees are, are judging the disciples of Jesus Christ because they're, they're walking through a field of grain and, and they eat the grain without washing their hands. And then it's like, oh, gasp. What a blasphemous thing to do that you're hungry and you eat. They said, no, you're not. You, you need to, the Pharisees, you need to go through this ceremonial washing. And Jesus is like, no. It's not what goes into a man that defiles him, he says. But what proceeds out of the mouth, he turns into a spiritual thing, defiles the man. What you say, what you teach, how you use language matters. Look at verse 14. He's talking to, his, to the disciples. He says this. He says, don't argue with these guys. He says, let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind guide guides a blind man, both fall into a pit. They're not helping anybody. Verse 18. For the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. There it is again. And those defile the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders, and so on and so forth. The distinction is clear. The tongue is unlike any other part of the body. Because it is able to communicate what's in a person's heart. Bringing devastation to the whole body, it says. Listen again, the whole, the, the whole of the Proverbs, they don't, they don't say things like, church, the, the toe defiles you. It didn't say that, right? It didn't say your leg defiles you. It didn't say your arm, it doesn't say all these things. It says your tongue. The tongue is mentioned because it is that very thing that causes you the most trouble. What is the third thing he says about this anatomy? Turn back to James. The third thing he says about this anatomy, it says, and sets on fire, the latter portion of verse 6, and sets on fire the course of our life. And this is even what I was saying earlier. This word for life, the definition of this is it means your, the whole of your existence. Now it's talking about not just the, the, the fact that it defiles your whole person. Now it's talking about it defiles the whole duration of your life. It goes the distance. If you do not get control of it, it's going to go until the day that you meet Christ. And stand before him and have to give an account for every word. The whole life, the whole course of it is 
defiled, the extent, the duration, the effect. Defiles your whole person, your character. Defiles your ethics. Even one harsh word, think about this, one harsh word can destroy marriage. One slanderous word, one juicy piece of gossip, one exaggeration. You exaggerate the truth or to prop yourself up to be something that you're not. God hates that. Or are you speaking in anger? This type of speech can spread across a lifetime and cause a lifetime of pain. I, I want you to think about something. If you had a relationship like that in the past, think about when you had to deal with, if, if you didn't deal with it in the past, you had a, a particular kind of speech that you would speak to your parents, you would speak to your significant other, you would speak to your best friend. And think about when you said something so harsh that it was not easy to forget. It may have taken you five seconds to say it, now think about how long it took to recover from that saying. It creates distrust, distrust and conflict that would take long periods of time to heal. Can God do it in a moment? Yes. If you're dealing with someone that's mature in Christ, to them it would be like going off, like water going off a duck's back. But for the one here that's at your level and, and you don't have a level of maturity, they don't have a level of maturity, you will cause damage that will take a long time to recover from. A life, it says. The last description that he shares here as the, as the anatomy of, of this fire, the tongue of fire, it says, and he said it is set on fire by hell. If it couldn't get worse, remember I told you this, it was getting worse, and this, this gets to the pinnacle of the worst thing that you could say about this uncontrolled tongue. It says, set on fire by, by hell itself. You know, it's, it's, it elevates this to an extreme consequence and using this word hell. But before he uses hell, he says, he says this. He says he uses the word in the Greek, it's phalagis. Phalagis o, if you want to put the, the verb. It's one word in the Greek, but it's three words in the English set on fire. This is an active verb. What what does this mean? What am I telling you this? It means this, an active verb meaning this is a pattern of life. This is not, oh, I just slipped up. No biggie. It's saying this is a pattern of life. You, you have no control over it. And then coupled with the usage of hell, only amplifies it even more serious Listen, let me tell you about the word hell. In the, in the Greek, it, it's Gehenna. But let, let me give you this understanding of, of why it's even used here. The only other usage is in the, in the Synoptic Gospels. And, and you know who used it most? And who actually used it only, actually, better yet, I'd rather say, is Jesus. He uses this word Gehenna, which in, in a literal translation means Hinnom Valley. Well, when we were in Israel back in May, we walked across a bridge and looked down into that valley. 
And at this point, there's nothing really there. You could see the valley, the gorge is deep. But, in this time, what was happening? This place, Gehenna, was right outside, south, southwest of the old Jerusalem, this valley. And in, in Old Testament times, it was used as, as a dumping ground for garbage, for dead animals, those carcasses. And then at times when they execute criminals, they would throw them there also. And then, periodically, they would set this thing aflame. Well, this wasn't the worst of it. In the times of the pagans, the Canaanites, and when Jerusalem was ruled by pagans, they would worship the false god of Molech. And even the Israelites started doing this really grotesque thing. What they would do is take their children... They would set ablaze this statue of Moloch with the arms like this, and they would sacrifice their kids right next to Gehenna. And then they would throw the carcasses of their dead children into this valley. And this place continually burned. Can you smell it? Decomposed bodies, trash, maggots. This is why Jesus used this word. If he had any illustration to tell you what hell was like, he said, you see Gehenna? That's what hell is like. Even worse, but you could see it. You could, you could smell it. He tells us that this anatomy of, of a tongue that is out of control is set ablaze by hell itself. And this hell is, listen, it's synonymous with with destruction, with the devil. I mean, he says it, even Jesus says in Matthew 25, he says that hell is, was created for the devil and his, his angels, his demons. And since it's synonymous with hell and the devil and demons, when you engage in ungodly speech, you are speaking the language of hell. And your tongue becomes satanic. I don't know if that sits heavy with you right now. That's how serious James took it. That's how serious Jesus took it. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. You can hear the words of Jesus again. This is what he says about hell and how serious he takes this type of sin. Look at verse 29. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into Gehenna. Verse 30. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one part one part of your body and for your whole body to go into Gehenna. Can we use this? Can we... If I could take license, if your tongue causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it away from you, 
It's better for you to lose your tongue than to go to hell. That's how serious this is. James separates these ideas in verse 7 and 8 in a form of shaming us. I want you to see this as that. And it's okay. I don't know if you understand, shame is good. You know, there's... um. Not on my notes, but there's this movement today. And, and it's, it was spurred on by, by the Me Too movement. Remember the Me Too movement? And, and cancel culture. And then what, what the world, what, what the church did is, it thought it would be a great idea to translate this into the church. And they, they created a hashtag church hurt. You know, I looked that up, and I thought, what do they mean by church hurt? Is there, is there, let me be clear about something. Is there, is there church hurt? Yes, there is. In bad churches, there is. A church that is based, based on the prosperity gospel, then yes, you're being taken advantage of, you're being hurt, quote-unquote. But the first definition of church hurt was this. If you go to a church that makes you feel guilt and shame, you are in that category of church hurt. You know what? Let me take a step back. If you think that's true, then you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with James. And if you have a problem with James, you have a problem with God. This is God's word. This is what God has utilized in the lives of believers to bring about change, holiness, righteousness. If you don't want to feel shame, then what you do is you remove yourself from being a perpetrator and you make yourself a victim of your whole life. Let me tell you something. You are not a victim. Bad things could have happened to you your whole life. You have been a perpetrator from your birth. It says you are born and shaped in iniquity. You have sinned against God from the moment you learned to lie and to cheat, to be selfish. It, it's not wrong to feel guilt. We don't stay there, but it's not wrong. If you don't feel guilt, then no change will happen. You won't see your need for Christ. So he takes us. Look at, look at James again. And James gives us this picture kind of shaming us as, as humanity, as a whole. This is what he says. It's every species of beasts of the, and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by human race. Is this not true? What, what do we do? We, we, we have tamed all these animals. You tame a, from a small, from a dog, a cat, a dolphin, an elephant, I mean, I remember still going to SeaWorld and seeing that they've tamed orcas, killer whales, lions, birds, seals. Yet, our lack of self-control over the tongue causes tremendous turmoil. It's almost like if we would line up a trained dog, a trained seal, a trained elephant, and then I put a man behind them, and I tell these three to kneel down. 
The animals all kneel down and the guy behind, he says, you don't tell me what to do. Who are you to try to control me? That's the stubbornness of our own heart that doesn't want to be tamed. And, and it does go down to the tongue, the way we talk. Think about it. When has a dog ever started a world war? When, when has he done that? Or a cat or an elephant? It sounds silly, doesn't it? But what does verse 8 tell us? But no one can tame the tongue. It is restless. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. You know, th this word restless, it, it takes us back to chapter 1. Go to chapter 1. And, and restless just in the Greek means unstable. You remember chapter 1, verse 8? Being a double-minded man, unstable, same word, in all his ways. Restless. Double-minded. You're being pulled two different ways. This is what he's talking about. Even the word usage that you see when he says that the poison... Turn back to James chapter 3. And full of deadly poison in the latter part of verse 8. This is in reference to Romans 3.13. And a matter of fact, Romans 3.13 is quoting Psalm 140 verse 3. And it says this in Psalm 140 verse 3. It says, They sharpen their tongue as a serpent." Poison of a viper is under their lips. And then he gives us this really sad declaration. Going back to verse 8, the beginning, it says, but no one can tame the tongue. That sounds hopeless, but we're going to come back to that. My second point is this, the problem of pretending. Verse 9, the problem with the pretending. Listen, our... Our speech is, is, is a spiritual gauge telling us of our true condition. I know I've been saying this, but repeating it should give greater, a greater emphasis so, we, emphasis so we can understand that, that when we give, when James gives us an, this an al analogy, I could give you a different one. You guys have seen your check engine light turn on, right? And, and, you know, I take it further. Your check engine light turns on, but your car doesn't do anything different. You keep driving, it just doesn't do anything. But I guarantee you this, if the voice of your car, the light turns on, and when the light turns on, you start hearing a clack, 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 clack. Your car is telling you something, it's vocalizing something. The light's good. The sound is worse. Keep driving. You're going to destroy your engine. This is the anatomy that he's talking about. The analogy of he's saying, look, the illustration is clear. You, What's coming out of your mouth. Have you ever said something you think, oh my gosh, I want to take it back. You know, like Peter, you know, foot and mouth disease, right? You want to take it back, but you... You can't because it, it's almost like the tongue dictates everything that you are. You can't really hide how you communicate. If you want to know what a person is all about, just let them talk. I mean, look what it says in verse 9. Here's the, the problem of pretending, the problem of hypocrisy. With it, with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father... And with it we curse men who can who have been made in the likeness of God. Listen, he gives this first blessing and cursing. Simple, simple understanding. One moment you are worshiping God. You may be driving here on a Sunday and you have worship music on, and then 
bam, someone cuts you off and what well, flies out of your mouth? That you were worshiping God. You're all holy, 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 and then you may not even vocalize it. You may just say it in your in your mind. That's your heart talking. The cursing, this cursing is the definition of this is expressing a loathing. A loathing of, of, of a person. You know, we come to, to church with the heart ready to worship. And from that same heart and mind, we have, we have disdain in our heart. We have resentment. We have envy. We have jealousy. We have hatred for someone else in the church. And then James gives us the highest reason to not be doing this. He doesn't tell you because, well, you know, they're a really good friend. No, it's not, that's, not, that's not important enough. They hold a position. No, that, that doesn't matter. No, this person, it says, is made in the likeness of God. The Imago Dei. Why do we respect all people? Why do we see people as, as image bearers equal of, of everything that the Lord would have for them? Why do we reject prejudice and racism? Why do we do that? Because everyone is made in the image of God. You know, I, I listened to, to Ben Shapiro the day after all this stuff happened in Israel. And you know, you could see everything that Hamas had done and, and the atrocities that they did. But you, you go too far. You start calling these people dogs and animals. I understand you're hurt. I understand that. But guess what? No one is outside of the reach of redemption. Because that would have been Ben Shapiro's view of Paul the Apostle. When he would go arrest people, whole families, to put them to death. When he held the coats of the man that murdered Stephen, showing approval for it. No, no, no. There are no dogs in humanity. There's just a lost world the same way you were lost. The image of God that you claim to worship, yet you curse men. You have a fundamental inconsistency in your worship. Short, you have a hypocrisy. This is still the double-minded man, like I said. Being pulled in two directions, one way to the world and its system, the way it thinks. Another one that worships God. Luke 16 says that no servant can serve two masters. he will love one and hate the other. You can't serve God and anything else. You can't serve God in hatred. and you can't do that. He gives us the other analogy, the, the fount. Sweet and bitter. He gives us the, the plants, the fig tree that can't give you olives. The thorn burst that can't give you neither. Look, he directs, James is directing us to the most natural thing we could understand. No one here is ridiculous enough to go outside to the avocado tree and expect an orange from that tree. No one 
would think that. So when the church decides to judge for itself, as Christ told us to judge, and he said that the fruit that would bear would show someone's relationship to God. But no, 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 we, we can't do that. We could judge the avocado tree. We could judge the fig tree. We can't judge someone's life. No, on the contrary, no. You can't live this duplicitous life. You can't live from a sweet spring and a, and a bitter spring. We don't gather, Jesus said this, you don't gather grapes from thorn bushes. You don't expect figs from vines. So why would we see any evidence of fruit, of fruit of someone that doesn't belong to Christ? Or why wouldn't we expect that fruit for someone that does claim Christ? Does a found send out from the same opening? You know what opening he's talking about? Right here. Fresh, bitter. The production of your person. In closing, I wanted to go back to verse 8 so you... You see that there is hope. It says in verse 8, no one can tame the tongue, it says, right? Well, in the same way when the disciples came to Jesus and he had sent the rich young ruler away because the rich young ruler would not give away his one God, which was his riches. He had a death grip on his stuff. And he tells this, the disciples, he tells them that it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man, and in context, a rich man that has a death grip on his things, a covetous man. And then the disciples responded this way, it says, then who can be saved? That's desperation. They knew that rich man. They said, we're not better than him. He tells him even the, if your righteousness does not exceed the Pharisees, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. Then he tells him this. He says, with man, salvation, context, Salvation with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So discouraging as this may seem, all of what James has told us, it should not surprise us. The reason the tongue is beyond human control is because it's the outflowing of the heart. This should humble us. And it should cause us to say, like Isaiah did. Isaiah 6, 4. Woe to me, I am undone. Why? Because he's seen the Lord Jesus on his throne. He's seen the perfected Christ. He's seen the holiness of God. He says, I am done. I'm ruined. And I live among people of unclean lips. We would do well to feel the heaviness as Isaiah did. And it would cause us to confess as he did. What was his confession? Let's, let's look at Isaiah 6 in closing.
Let me paint the picture for you here. It says this. Verse 5 first, so we could read it together so you could see it. And I said, Woe is me, I am ruined or undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then, then in an, in, in an emphatic, God is directing these angels. He says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with the burning coal on his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, what does he say? Behold. Same word from our passage. Behold. This has touched your lips and your iniquity has, has taken away and your sin is forgiven. This is the hope we have. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. God is willing to put the coals of, of fire of, to purify your speech. If you belong to him, this is possible. If you don't, your entrance into this is the righteousness of Christ alone. You must surrender your life to him. You must see yourself as that Everything that James has described of the mouth, the uncontrolled tongue, the outpouring of your heart that is storing up for itself daily wrath. But God, in his mercy, sent his son to live a life that was perfect, with perfect speech. An atoning death on a cross and rising from the dead. That is our only hope. And God is willing and able to do both. So before I close, I want to read to you a few of my application questions that I haven't done in a while, but let me read these off to you. Application question number one. What do you need to confess to the Lord tonight? What do you need to confess to the Lord tonight? The second sub-question within that first one is, will you do that? Not tomorrow. Tomorrow's the devil's day. Tonight. Number two. What challenged you most about these verses? Number three, what immediate change needs to happen in your speech? What immediate change needs to happen in your speech? Number four, is there someone you need to seek forgiveness from for ungodly speech? Sub-question of that. Will you do that tonight? Number five. Last question. Will you commit to prayer your need for the Holy Spirit to guard your speech? Will you commit to prayer your need for the Holy Spirit to guard your speech? Pray with me. Father, we are helpless without you. In our speech and in salvation. So I pray now that if there are some here that have not committed their life to Christ, that you would enable them by that Holy Spirit to grant repentance and faith. That they would see their need for the redemption that is found only in your Son that they would even reject the gates of hell, the valley of Gehenna that awaits all those that reject your son. Grant them faith and repentance. And for your church, I pray that you strengthen her 
that you would turn their, their shame into gladness. You would transform their guilt into transformation. And by doing so, that you would further glorify yourself in them as you transform them into the image of your Son. We ask these things in His name. Amen.